Hello everyone, my name is Andy Wilmoth. I'm going to talk to you about uh, primary education in England. Here are the headlines. There's a, a mixture of schools in England, both local authority maintains so directly funded through the local authority. And also we have independent uh, fee paying schools. Confusingly, they're usually called public schools because anyone can go there, but they are fee paying schools and they are run independently of government control. Within the state school sec sector, the maintained sector, some schools, about 75% are under local authority control, controlled by the, um, the council, county council. 25% um, are now free of local authority control and are run by an academy trust uh, funded directly from government. Even more confusingly, about a third of schools are faith schools, mostly Christian, but there are some Muslim and Jewish and Sikh schools as well. And uh, those schools have different rules of applying to them. Some schools, including all maintained schools, have to follow the national curriculum, which sets out what should be taught in each year of school. However, independent schools, fee paying schools, and academies don't have to follow the national curriculum. So, more confusion there. In a minority of local authorities, there is a selection process for secondary school places. A growing number of children, but currently around 60,000, uh, are homeschooled. Compulsory schooling starts for a child in the term after they're five. However, the vast majority of children will start to attend school the year before uh, in what's called reception class. All three and four year old children in England are entitled to free part-time early education paid for through a, a voucher scheme. Um, that, that is sometimes, but not, not always, um, a facility based at the school that they would go on to attend. Um, but there are private um, nursery school facilities as well. Once of statutory school age, a child's attendance is strictly monitored and controlled. And parents can be fined. Um, they can also be prosecuted if they don't uh, ensure that their children attend school regularly. This is very strict in England to the extent that Parents are not allowed to take their children out for a holiday in term time, for example. For the most part in England, we have a tradition of starting formal schooling, formal teaching, earlier than a lot of our, our Euro European neighbours. Um, so from the age of four, children will be learning um, phonics and early number work. Schools have a high degree of autonomy. So issues of hiring and firing, setting vision and values, designing the curriculum, spending the budget, uh, organizing teaching and support staff, these fall within the purview of the head teacher, which means that schools are dependent on having uh, effective leaders. And uh, there's a countrywide scheme providing additional funding for children who are assessed as being disadvantaged. And in this case, disadvantaged means that uh, they are entitled to claim free school meals due to their parents and financial circumstances. These children have been 
identified as being at risk of um, poor academic performance. They tend to do less well in education. And so there's a focused attempt by government to redress this. The performance of schools is very data driven in England. There's a huge amount of data available, but the primary source of data would be um, moderated national testing. The results of national tests are published and schools are judged against the results of these tests. And it is expected that schools will show that their results are at least in line with national averages. Uh, just think about that for a moment, the implication of, of all schools having to ensure that their results are at least in line with national averages. Can you see the flaw? We've seen over the last few years improving trends in headline data, and that's certainly expected of schools. Schools are expected to be in a continuous cycle of improvement. So if your data is going up year on year, that's a good thing. If there's a downward trend, then you'll be looked at very carefully. Schools are expected to track individual student progress and show good progress, whatever the starting points of the students may be. And data will be analysed uh, to ensure gender equality over time. When it comes to vulnerable groups, those groups who are known to be at risk of underperforming, groups like children with special needs, SEM, or LAC looked after children, their performance will be tracked very carefully too. And schools are expected to show a diminishing difference between the performance of those children in vulnerable groups and the general school population. One of the uh, implications of having a data-led education system is that school inspection is very um, hard-edged and very much focuses on the data. Now, data is a good thing, but of course it's very possible to misuse it. So we have to be careful to make sure that when we interpret the school's data, we, we use it to ask probing questions rather than using it to draw unsafe conclusions. The inspection process for primary schools is a one or two day inspection. Uh, a short inspection of one day would confirm the school's previous status. If it was a good school before and the inspector sees no reason to change that judgment, then you get a short inspection. Or we have a two day inspection if the um, status of the school is likely to change. The inspection framework is um, a political issue in England and it tends to change every few years, uh, meaning that schools have to dance to a different tune each time. I think most schools consider the inspection framework um, important in order to provide accountability. Um, Inspectors look at the school's program of self-evaluation and determine if the school is making reliable judgments about its own performance. And the, the data from national testing, of course, is very important here. In many parts of England, if a school does poorly in an inspection, the head teacher will be dismissed. I would summarise by saying that primary schools in England have undoubtedly improved since 1980, which is when I joined the teaching profession. 
um, primary school teachers, particularly good teachers, work exceptionally hard. 29% uh, of teachers have said that they worked more than 51 hours per week. That statistic is about primary and secondary teachers. Um, but to teach in England and be effective, you know that you're going to have to put in the hours. What this illustrates is that teaching is uh, a challenging profession. However, um, most teachers I know would still say that if you have a vocation for primary school teaching in England, it, it can be, and for many people is, the best job in the world. Thank you. Okay, um, now just a little bit about primary education in Uganda. Uh, I've worked in Uganda um, as a consultant since 2012, and I spent a year as um, principal of a primary school and international school uh, in 2018. So I've seen for myself the state of education in Uganda. Uganda introduced uh, universal free primary education in 1997, which was a, quite a progressive move. Oops. However, the rapid influx of students into schools uh, created enormous problems uh, of um, under capacity. Um, funding wasn't really adequate and in some instances teachers weren't paid so they didn't turn up um, or they charged parents school fees to make up for the fact that their wages weren't being paid. So Universal free primary education hasn't been a complete success, although it has resulted in a much higher percentage of students attending primary school than was previously the case. In order to leave primary school, students need to pass primary leaving exams. These are quite challenging exams, and many students don't pass for years. For this reason, and because of late entry to, to primary education, there's overage studying in all schools. It's not unusual to find, for example, a grade three class with an age range between seven and 16. And you can imagine the challenges that that creates for teachers. Schools remain poorly funded. Teachers are not well paid, so they often have to take second or third jobs. Um, and the drive to improve primary education is um, reduced to a certain extent because more wealthy families are able to send their children to fee-paying international schools rather than local schools. So, What's life like for teachers in primary schools in Uganda? Uh, issues with funding and organisation remain. Um, so universal primary education is still needing to develop and improve. Formal education starts at the age of six. There, there are some opportunities for pre formal education, but these are, there's quite a low take up of that in Uganda. And um, primary education lasts seven years. Teachers aren't paid well, and they're not very um, well regarded by society. Um, very often their wages aren't paid on time. Uh, the education of teachers tends to be poor, and so the quality of teaching tends to be poor. There's a target teacher-student ratio of 1 to 40, but classes of 70 to 150 are really quite common, and classes of 200 are not unheard of. Statistically, girls are less likely to attend school, and they're less likely to perform as well as boys. So girls are disadvantaged throughout the education system. Some action has been taken to mitigate this, but it remains an issue. 
only about 38% of students leave primary school to go to secondary school. The other 62% will go to work in the fields or go out to work or be at home looking after their parents. Attendance at primary school tends to be higher in urban areas than in rural areas, but even so, attendance is relatively poor. So maybe um, it's 85% in the city, something like that. Teacher absenteeism tends to be high. Uh, teachers not turning up to school uh, is quite a regular occurrence. Uh, the statistic I read for teacher absenteeism was 60%. So quite a chaotic provision um, leading to poor standards, uh, low student outcomes and a very low take up of uh, secondary education. So there's a lot more to be done in Uganda to improve the quality of education. Thank you very much, Andrew, for the presentation. Um, you talk about uh, schools in UK. You have experiences in two different contexts. So you talk about the one in UK where there are private schools, faith schools, local authority, and so on. And then you move on to your uh, to the one in Uganda, your experiences in U Uganda. You talk about the educational landscape, which is quite different from that in UK, and also about the context in Uganda. Okay, which I could gather from from this presentation. 